Okay, let's, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to have time here. Um, glad to see everyone this morning. Um, Laura and I, are, we, we had kids last Sunday and, and, and worship. And we were blowing their noses, and now we're blowing our noses. <laughs> anyway, so it's, uh, we got a cold, but anyway, it's, it's, that's not the end of the world. Anyway, we're glad. We have our good friends, Steve and Sharon Bowman, here from Knoxville. We went to see them when the eclipse was in Knoxville, and then, uh, we're, they're seeing us when the eclipse is in Dallas. And, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Bowman. They've been very good friends to us. We, we met each other at First Baptist in the same Sunday school class. Um, in Knoxville. In Knoxville. And when... Um, <laughs> to clarify, <laughs> the first Baptist thing you meant. So anyway, the, um, when Laura and I were mentors and seekers, we were, we were, we were originally in Compass class, so we're still associate members, and we were seekers for five years. Lauren Hollis's dad died in East Tennessee. And um, I asked Steve if he could go to the funeral to represent us, and he went. He drove 50 miles to the funeral. Mm -hmm. It was Jerry Deacons at First Baptist at that time, and went over and did represent the Seekers class. And Hollis says we'll never forget it. So mm -hmm. we appreciate that very much. Okay, let's go through some um, announcements. Um, Church wide, you need to read um, Ralph Manuel's preparing for worship when you get a chance. Page nine. There will be an eclipse party tomorrow from noon till two. We'll be able to see the bottom of the clouds, I think, but we'll see. I hope it's better. I hope it's better. Um, register today for the April 12th Marriage Connection um, EWIM uh, documentary screening. You'll see that on page 9 as well. Uh, new Bible Translation and Worship, the Inclusive Bible. And here's one on page 10. I hate to see Merrick Gillette is, is going to UT Southwestern now. We're going to miss him. I'll tell you, he's good. He is really good. But good for him. Um, next Sunday, uh, Robert P. Jones and, and Greg Garrett, who will preach, are, are going to do uh, studies on deep, the deep roots of racism in the Christian church. Um, and Mark Wingfield will be doing a, a web a webinar for uh, Baptist News Global on that. Um, that's something next Sunday afternoon. Uh, that's on page 11. Uh, let's see here. Uh, lunch and Learn. You'll see that on Wednesdays um, on page 13. Uh, we had the first one of the Gospel of Aretha Franklin last Sunday. I mean, last Wednesday night. That was good. It was good. I had no idea she had four children before she turned 18 years old. Oh my God. Incredible. First one at 12. First one at 12. And just amazing. That could be why she wrote the song Respect, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. exactly. Uh, so that's on page 13. Uh, Laura Diffie is our I Am Wilshire for today. And uh, that's a good one on the, on the, for Laura. And summer activities are on the back on page 16 and some and every, everything else is on that. Any other church-wide announcements we need to go through before we get started? Hey, one thing about the uh, eclipse tomorrow, I just sat in the kitchen on the radio, I was driving, they were interviewing two guys who've been to every eclipse for as long as they've been adults, I think. That's what they do. And they just made one statement. They said, now you're sitting there and here it comes. Don't look around, don't start talking. It lasts about two and a half minutes, mm -hmm. and if you get your attention over there, you won't even see it. You'll miss it. Yeah. So if you're going to come look at it, you might as well see it. That's it. That's it. Okay, anything else? Any other church-wide type announcements? Uh, Paul, if you go back about 1035 or 1040, I know you have to be on this service today. I'm going to pass around a list. Uh, just uh, for This is for our uh, Sunday School party on the 20th, and um, you're welcome to bring other people if you want on this thing, and we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll hopefully have some fun and catch some fish. And the, pe most people don't fish, they stay in the house and talk. <laughs> anyway, if you'll sign this up. Oh, and the, I'll bring this over here. Two colors. Uh, it's all yours. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. And thanks for, thanks for allowing me to come back uh, after our donkey lesson last time. <laughs> yeah, the donkey lesson was a tough one. <laughs> Uh, we are in the book of Acts uh, this week, and we're going to be talking about the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, it's at the end of chapter 8 of Acts. If somebody would like to read that, we're in verses 26 through the end of the chapter, I guess, 340. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court of the 
a court official of the Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of the entire treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his, humili in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and started with the scripture. He proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. <clears throat> When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Thank you. So I wrote a passage up here on the board behind me that's not in what you just read. Uh, that's from uh, the first. Uh, chapter of Acts. And these are Jesus's last words or one of the last words that he said to the disciples. Um, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, that one phrase is kind of the outline of the entire book of Acts. The way Luke uh, presents the book of Acts is following this pattern. And this story that we've just read is one of the transition points for beginning. It, I read one thing that said it's the end of the beginning. Another said it's the beginning of the end. Uh, depending on how you want to look at it, this is where the story begins to transition from the church in Jerusalem to the church at large. Um, We've got two main characters in the story, uh, Philip and the eunuch. The eunuch is never named. Um, and let's talk about the people first, just to kind of get the characters in line. Uh, first of all, Philip. What do we know about Philip? Disciple. He's, he's one of the disciples, one of the deacons that was appointed at the very, or just about two chapters ago, when all the apostles got together and said, we're, we're being overwhelmed with all of the duties that we have to do. And they, they asked uh, the disciples, I guess, to appoint seven people uh, to be deacons with the, the role to be to serve the widows and orphans and to help out so they could, so the apostles could focus on preaching, teaching, evangelizing. Um, and two of the people that we kind of follow of those, they named all seven of them, but the two biggies are Stephen and Philip. And Stephen, just right after he gets named, ends up getting stoned. And this story is happening pretty quickly after the stoning of Stephen, and we're now following Philip. Um, Was Philip the one that Jesus called the son of encouragement? I don't that's Barnabas. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I, uh, Philip was not one of the twelve. Oh, okay. He was appointed later when they, after Jesus's death, they appointed these seven deacons to help out the. Oh, yeah. Well, they 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 were down to eleven because they lost Judas, and then they appointed a replacement for Judas, and then they, in addition to that, they got these seven people, of which Philip and Stephen are are two of them. Um, but it's interesting that they had they were appointed for a distinct job. They were to care for the widows and orphans. Uh, but we almost immediately see Stephen doing signs and wonders and healings, 
gets crossways with uh, some of the temple higher ups. Uh, it looks like he was falsely accused and stoned to death. And now we've got Philip, who also appears to be out preaching. He's gone to Samaria. It's like he leaves Jerusalem. There's kind of an exodus out of Jerusalem after the stoning of Stephen. Uh, this is before the conversion of Paul. So he's still Saul, and he's still persecuting Christians in Jerusalem. Um, and after the stoning of Stephen, they're saying, you know, this seems like they're pretty serious about this. And they kind of scatter a little bit. And Philip ends up in Samaria. We don't really know why he went to Samaria. Um, but he, Philip is in Samaria and apparently having quite a bit of success. What I wonder about is we've got Stephen was preaching, healing, doing signs and wonders, getting stoned to death. Philip is off in Samaria preaching, evangelizing very successfully. I just kind of wonder who's taking care of the widows. Um, they, they appointed these seven people to do that, but it seems like they're going well beyond what they were appointed to do, which is something I think we should think about. But, um, the stories that we get from them are not about the caring of the widows and the orphans. It's, uh, they've moved well beyond that. Um, and Philip is in Samaria having a very successful uh, evangel evangelizing mission trip, whatever you want to call it. And the Spirit appears to him and tells him to leave Samaria, go south out of Jerusalem, uh, on a desert road after one guy. And this one guy isn't even Jewish. He's not Israeli. He's an Ethiopian. He's a eunuch. The fact that he is a eunuch is mentioned seven times in the 14 verses you just read. Um, Repetition is usually an indication that this is something we're supposed to pay attention to. Uh, so we have this eunuch, foreigner, non-Jewish, um, and the Spirit is sending Philip after this one person, abandoning a fairly successful um, mission opportunity to do this. Um, so if we look at our quote up here from chapter 1, we've got, they started in Jerusalem, they kind of got kicked out of Jerusalem, all of Judea is the country that surrounds Jerusalem, to Samaria, Philip ends up in Samaria, all we're left with is the ends of the earth. And the Ethiopian eunuch, Ethiopia, Ethiopia is not the country that we think of today, although it's in roughly that same area. It's a region that was actually quite a bit larger than what the country of Ethiopia is. Probably encompassed some of what is Sudan today, but it's an area south of Egypt in, in Africa. Um, if, if I were to reference somebody going to Timbuktu today, does anybody even know where that is? <laughs> the ends of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> right. like Morocco or something. It, it just means someplace a long way away. Yeah. Um, and it's actually in it's in Africa somewhere. I'm not sure. I think of Morocco or something. Yeah, it's like it, right? somewhere in that. It's more in the western side of the continent. But anyway, point is, it's a long way away. And for a remember, Luke is writing the Book of Acts. He's addressing it. To Greek people, and he, he's writing this in a, probably around the 90s. Um, so the church is is somewhat established by this point, but he's writing the history of how did we get from where we were with the crucifixion of Christ to where we are today. So this the story is taking place, and, we're, and the part that we're talking about here is, like I said, before the the conversion of Paul. So we're early in the process. And he's he's trying to explain to us how we're how we're going to get to where 
to where we end up today. Um, the, uh, sorry, lost my, um, so we know, so we've got this eunuch that Philip is going to talk to. We get one verse in verse 27 that tells us a whole lot about this eunuch. Just in one verse. We know he's a eunuch, it's mentioned multiple times. He is an official of the Candace, which they refer to Candace like it's a title, more than a name. Um, uh, the Queen of Ethiopia. He's in charge of the treasury, so he's not an insignificant person. Um, and he's come to worship in Jerusalem. So Ethiopia, as I said, is well south of Egypt. This is probably, I've, I've read anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 miles, depending on where he started, to get from Ethiopia to Egypt. I mean, sorry, to Jerusalem. And he's doing this at, on a chariot. Uh, estimates are that that would take somewhere around two months, one way. So he makes a, a two-month trip to get from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. <clears throat> As a eunuch, he's not even allowed in the temple. Um, and we don't know how long he spends in Jerusalem. And now he's on his way back. So he's on this two-month journey on the way back. He's reading a scroll of Isaiah, um, an actual written scroll would have been very rare, very expensive. So this, this person obviously has some means. He's got the money to have the scroll. He has the flexibility to take at least four months off of his, what seems like a fairly important job, uh, to make this trip. He, he clearly has some sort of relationship with God, although he's not Jewish, um, in order to make this sort of commitment. To, so I'm going to spend the money, I'm going to get this scroll, I'm going to take months off and leave and go on this incredible journey, which I, I can't even conceive of it. Um, and... <clears throat> So he's, like I said, he's a, a person of means of some sort and is on this trip and Philip is sent to talk to him. Um, he, uh, as I mentioned, he's not even allowed mm -hmm. in the temple as a, a, a eunuch is a male who's been castrated. They're typically uh, they're often slaves that were captured as children. Um, if he was castrated young, which is frequently the case, he would have, uh, that would have impacted his physical development. His voice probably wouldn't have changed. He wouldn't have developed facial hair. Um, his body would fill out differently. Uh, they're, they're visibly different. This is a a person who, from a Jewish point of view, would be very much of an outsider. Uh, they would, you could look at them and tell that they were different. Uh, they were, uh, in addition to being Ethiopian, he would have physically looked different. Uh, his voice would have been different. So he's excluded from the temple, and he would know this, but he still makes this incredible journey to go visit. Um, so he's essentially a, a triple outsider, if you will. He's a foreigner. He's not Jewish. He's um, a eunuch. He's been castrated, so he's, he's physically uh, not fit to enter the temple. From a Jewish perspective, they would, have, they would say that he is not suitable to approach God, which is why they would not allow him into the temple. But what we have in this story is God very clearly approaching him. Uh, we have the Spirit directing Philip towards him. You know, God is interested in pursuing this person, even though the Jewish faith would say this person is not allowed into the presence of God. Um, which is a, another, there's a whole lot of different things we can start to unwind in this story. But that's one of them, is this idea of the, um, the idea of uh, outsiders, is a theme that runs throughout 
uh, Luke and Acts. It, it's an important theme to the author. Um, we have um, <coughs> the story of the uh, prodigal son, the Good Samaritan, um, are all in the book of Luke. We have uh, the story of Christ saying that uh, uh, prophets are not welcome in their hometown. Uh, all of these, this idea, this recurring theme that uh, outsiders are uh, are somebody that Jesus is pursuing, which is very contrary to the traditional Jewish faith, which says, no, you're not, because of this situation, you're not allowed into the temple. We've had stories of of other beggars where uh, one of the apostles would approach a, a cripple laying at the gate of the temple. <coughs> they're laying at the gate of the temple because they're not allowed inside. They're excluded. Um, and when they're healed, they're now welcomed back into the community. But until that point, they are excluded from the community. So th this idea that, that Christ is dealing with these traditionally unclean people and we're now seeing in Acts that this behavior is continuing, not through the apostles, what the, the former 12, it's now expanded to the, uh, these deacons, and we see the Holy Spirit getting involved at this one. Uh, so it, it's clear that this story is going beyond what a traditional Jewish exclusion would be. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, while he's talking to him, the scripture that he reads, uh, that, that he is reading, is from the book of Isaiah. And, and my Bible is kind of inset a little bit, so you can tell which pieces are, are out of Isaiah. Um, and the um, eunuch asked Philip probably the key question in the whole phrase Who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself, or is he talking about somebody else? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I think I'm getting your cold notes. Um, from a Jewish perspective, the answer would be, he's, this is Isaiah talking about himself. He's, he's referring to himself when he talks about um, sheep being led to the slaughter, and so on. Um, but that's not how Philip answers the question. Philip interprets this the way we would interpret it today. Is these this is a um, scripture referring to Christ? This is a uh, messianic um, prophecy, very un-Jewish. Uh, so he, Philip uses this opportunity to interpret this story in a very Christian format, telling the, the good news to the eunuch, um, interpreting this in the form of a Christian message. Remember, this was written probably, Luke would have been writing the book of Acts probably around the early 90s, so very early in the life of the church. And we already have the church this early on interpreting Isaiah as a messianic prophecy. This isn't something new that the church came up with in the, you know, in the 1500s or something like that. Very early on, the church was inter reinterpreting the Jewish scriptures as prophesying the coming of the Messiah and that Christ is the fulfillment of that. Did Jesus, did Jesus say that to the disciples? Did he use Old Testament scripture? He, and he did. Okay. I don't know that he ever used this one. Uh, this is from Isaiah 53, if anybody wants to read that. Um, and, but, uh, yeah, Jesus often used, I mean, any time that Jesus would have quoted, quoted scripture, it would have been Old Testament. Um, and and he did on occasion, but he typically wasn't using it as a prophecy, so to speak. Was he trying, was he talking about himself? Did he apply this to himself? That's a good question. 
Because I'm I, just wondering yeah. if they took that. <clears throat> Does that necessarily have yeah. to be attended? Yeah. Uh, he would say things like he was the son of man. Uh, I don't know that he was, and he would talk about things happening in order to fulfill scripture. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like he was m moving in that direction. I don't recall him ever actually <coughs> using this particular scripture. I, I could be wrong. Um, but he, uh, the, the church by the by the 90s had certainly adopted that as as a common interpretation of the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> oh. So the the answer to this question is essentially this is the kind of thing that Stephen was doing that got him stoned. Oh. The the Jewish temple hierarchy would not have <coughs> agreed with. Philip's interpretation of this scripture as presented to the uh, and as presented to us today, um, and and their their methods of disagreeing are not just to sit in a room and argue about it. They, they, it's not a midrash. They, <laughs> they they take you out and and stone you. Um, so so Philip's sticking his neck out a little bit. Um, but he's alone in the desert, out in the middle of nowhere, so maybe he's safer. Um, but in any case, he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't shy away from spreading the good news. And the eunuch reacts to this. Um, we are told at the end that the, uh, Philip just literally disappears. It's not like he disappears from the story. He, vanishes. We don't really know. He appears again in another city and we, we don't know if the unit took a nap and he walked off or whatever, but at some point Philip <coughs> vanishes from the scene and the unit doesn't see him anymore. And the unit, we're told, goes on his way rejoicing. All right. The Ethiopian area uh, turns into a fairly significant Christian stronghold. And legend has it that this Ethiopian convert is was the original missionary to the Ethiopian area, and that Christianity Christianity spread into Central Africa from this story. Now, if we remember that Luke is writing this to a Greek audience, so the, the story is taking place down here on this road. To Gaza, There's our, we're still talking about Gaza today. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we're on the road somewhere between Jerusalem and Gaza. Uh, Samaria would have been up here. So we've got Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now we've got a Greek audience. They don't even appear on this map, not on this map either. Greeks way up here, off the map this way. Um, Ethiopia is off the map down here, so I don't know why I needed a map to show you two places that aren't on it. <laughs> but that's where we're talking. So, from a point is from a Greek audience, from a Greek audience's perspective, Ethiopia is the ends of the earth. We have moved this story from a Greek point of view from Jerusalem to Judea. Philip's gone to Samaria, and now we've got the Ethiopian eunuch is going to head off the map south. And I'm thinking that there may be, there's probably a lot of people in Greece that wouldn't even know where Ethiopia is. They would react the same way you did with Timbuktu. Yeah, I know it's a long way away. That, that's about <coughs> it. It's, I've heard it exists. I have no idea where it is, but I bet I can't walk there. So that's <laughs> Certainly, I'm not going to get two months to do it. Um, <clears throat> so we've now, in, this is where I was talking about how this story is the transition point. This is where we, we get all of those areas in this one story. If, other than the stoning of Stephen just happened in Jerusalem. Philip immediately goes to Samaria. 
he's called to the Ethiopian eunuch who gets us to the ends of the earth. All in about 14 verses. And the story from this point forward in Acts is going to start transitioning into we're going to get the conversion of, of Saul and Paul and Paul's missionary journeys expanding the church into Asia Minor and Europe. But this is that transition point as we start to roll that focus from Jerusalem to the rest of the world and from a European perspective to the ends of the earth when we go hit Ethiopia. Um, Paul, you may have said this earlier, but it was the Ethiopian um, eunuch, was he, was he kind of sent to go get a scroll? I mean, I, I can't imagine somebody reading, it must have been reading out loud, yeah. you know, going down the road. That's just very unusual. But. Uh, the, I, we don't know. Uh, our assumption is, that the, the stuff I've read on it, is the assumption that he is a God-fearing, fairly well-off individual, and that he purchased the scrolls in some, <coughs> for his own use. And uh, traditionally in, in the ancient world, when you read, you did read aloud. Now, it's hard to imagine, I, I get headaches reading in a car. I, I can't imagine <laughs> reading a scroll in a chariot. <laughs> um, but he is apparently moving, because Philip runs alongside the chariot to catch up to him, and is hearing him and talking to him, and finally the eunuch says, why don't you get in? <laughs> and so they continue their conversation as they're rolling, and then they see the body of water and decide to, to go get, get baptized. Um, so th that, that part of the story bothered me a little bit too. I, I'm trying to picture, I, I don't think chariots had just incredible suspensions. <laughs> um, and I'm sure the roads weren't paved. <laughs> and and the, they, they didn't have Goodyear tires on them. Um, and trying to, I mean, it's not a book, it's a, it's a scroll. And trying to read that while you're unrolling it, and I guess you read vertically in Hebrew. And, Which is and, a foreign language for him. I, he, he was a, it seems like he's well educated. Yeah, that's what I was uh, He's, and, and he, this isn't his first exposure no. to, to Judaism. But it's not his favorite. <coughs> Probably not. Um, but he, it's it, you know how did he? His whole backstory is, is would be very interesting. We're not given it. How did he come to to know so much about this the the Jewish faith that he said, you know, I want to. I think I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to see the temple. I know they're not going to let me in. I just want to see it. Would have loved to have known who his mentor was. Yeah, and, and how did the message get down there? And where did he get the scroll? And, what, and did he buy it in Jerusalem, maybe, as a souvenir to, to take back? <laughs> something, something the, I was going to say something for the kids, but as a eunuch, he would um, So, but this, this idea of how did he, you know, how did he learn all this is, is a very intriguing thought. You know, but... But he ends up in Jerusalem with the scroll, and he's now coming back home and reading it um, when Philip runs into him. We have another interesting phrase. When you read that uh, earlier, um, what do you see for verse 37? Anybody want to read verse 37? Where is yes. it? <laughs> and Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And yeah. he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what, uh, what translation do you have? Uh, the, uh, this is one is the New American Standard. Okay. The New American Bible has a verse 37. Most of, the, most, of the King James, most of the King James versions will have a verse 37. It's in our footnote. It's in the footnote, but it's not in the actual meaning. So yeah. can, you, can you read? This is New Revised Standard. Yeah, the New Revised Standard doesn't have it. The New Revised Standard Updated Edition doesn't have it. I have an old Revised Standard doesn't have it. I think the New International Version doesn't have it, but the, it refers to it in a footnote. Yeah. You know, they've always said way back when 
you know, people were trying to write this, put the Bible together. Yeah. And probably a lot of them kind of like that verse. They may have added it or they may have yeah. subtracted it, and that happened throughout. So what, the, what they believe, uh, <laughs> somebody read that. What Does somebody have 37 and read it? So where, where this occurs in uh, 36, the... Mm -hmm. Ethiopian has just seen the body of water and says, what prevents me from being baptized? Mm -hmm. And 37 gets inserted here. Mm -hmm. If somebody could read that. And Philip said it. If you believe... Well, that's... Do oh, you want me to read 36 and 37? Sure. Uh-huh. 36. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? 37. And Philip said... If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then it resumes with uh, the baptism and coming out of the water and Philip disappearing. Um, the older versions of the text that, that we have discovered do not contain that verse 37. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was apparently, so it does not appear that when Luke wrote the story that he included that verse. That, that caused some problems um, for the church early on where they, they had, dis it was determined that a confession of faith in Christ was an important part of the conversion. And there, there wasn't one in this story. This is a person who is told the good news, he believes, he sees the body of water, asked to be baptized, Philip has no problem going and baptizing him, mm -hmm. and then we have the legend of what goes on with this Ethiopian, but there was never a confession of faith in the story. So sometime after Luke wrote it, it got inserted. Um, Why what? It, on the one hand, it, it doesn't purport to be a transcript of the conversation. Right. Yes. Um, right, yeah. it's, it's a pretty recorded. summary in that it says he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. I suspect that was more than a sentence or two. Yeah. On the other hand, it is a pretty important detail yeah. <laughs> that he might have <laughs> said, um, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That, yeah. that does seem like a big missing spot. And it's, the, the real question is, was that an important part of the conversion process that early in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't know the answer. Um, by, the, like I said, this was probably, Luke would have been writing this in the 90s. That verse was probably added in the early hundreds. So 20 to 30 years after Luke wrote it, that, so, so it did happen early. They have early, early text. We don't have the original text of anything written in the Bible. Uh, um, we have, they have manuscripts that have been copied and yeah. over and over again, and they can date those. So they have some that go back pretty far, and they can tell which ones came first. Um, they can age them. And the oldest ones do not include this, but later ones do. Um, so when they wrote the New Revised Standard Version, which I have here, it's not there at all. It probably has a footnote. Uh, the sometimes the there's like mine has a little has a 37 in brackets with no words, and then there's a footnote at the oh, bottom. Oh wow! Okay. Well, then it explains like going yeah, from 36 yeah. to 38, right? Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> at least that because we're sitting here. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not there. It, it at least had the uh, mine has the 37 shows up in the text just with no words next to it. It just the end of 36 and it has a 37 and then 38 and goes on. I didn't even notice. It it just, and, yeah, and I didn't notice it when I read it. In the original King James version, would it be in the text? Oh, yeah. Yes, King James sure. had it, has it in there. And King James today, the new, or mm -hmm. the new King James version still has it. Oh, yeah. um, and they may have some of them. I, I didn't look at every possible one, but I've seen some that included it that had a footnote saying older text didn't have it. That's have, in the King James. It's in the King James. Does it's it have a footnote saying that it yeah. was? It's not it? in the message. Okay. <laughs> uh, most of the ones that don't have it have a footnote mentioning it. 
and some of the ones that do have it have a footnote saying some of the older texts don't have it. So that, um, but the scholars are pretty much in agreement that Luke did not include this when he wrote the story. So um, someone, after Luke wrote it, inserted it. Yes. When you ride down the highway, the chariot speed. And don't tell them what they talked about. Yeah, that was true uh, point, Travis. You know, maybe they did talk about it, but, but, but Philip himself but, didn't think it was all that important. Right. But the, the, in this story, like I said, the, Luke is writing this in the 90s, but the story is probably taking place, this is before Paul's conversion, so it's probably taking place in the 40s, maybe. This is probably within 10 years of Christ's crucifixion. Um, and clearly <clears throat> Philip wasn't there. At best we can tell, there's only two people that were present. But it's not clear that Philip, that, that Luke had a personal interaction with either one of those two. So at, at best, I'm thinking Luke got this second hand. Uh, maybe he found somebody who knew the Ethiopian or somebody who had talked to Philip and Philip had told him the story. So he's certainly getting this second hand. There was nobody dictating this conversation. Would there have been a driver? Possibly. Uh, I hope that this but, is what but, but Heather and I were just talking about because if there was no driver, that means the guy's reading yeah. the scroll while he's driving the chariot, and yeah. that is distracted yeah, driving. Like <laughs> 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 yeah. So Paul's conversion, Paul's conversion was in AD 37. 37? And Christ, we assume, was crucified around 33, I think. No, around 30, probably. 30 to 33. Yeah. So this is within somewhere in that seven-year time frame because um, Paul was involved if we remember during the starting of Stephen we, we were told that Paul approved of the of the stone or Saul at that point mm -hmm. um, and we're before that conversion which is coming up in the next chapter or two but point is we don't have a transcript of this conversation but for whatever reason Luke if there was you know, if Philip said, oh yeah, I talked to him and asked him to make a confession, Luke did believe it was important enough to include it in the story. Mm -hmm. Or it may have just been a confession that just stood yeah, out. Yeah, it fold out. Um, and I can see, like, I could totally see the room of people trying to decide on what needs to be included in the scriptures. you got your legalists who are like, by the letter of the law. They have to verbalize it, they have to say it. And then there's people over here going, but if it's in their heart, yeah. they don't have to say the exact words, you know? Like, it, I can totally see people arguing and going, no, it needs to be in there. And, and because, we're going to get you know, very, arguments, X, y, <coughs> arguments very similar to this are going to happen later in Acts between Paul and Peter yeah. about how the Gentiles are converting and mm -hmm. do they need to be fully Jewish oh, yeah. before, yeah. Yeah. do they need to follow the food laws? Do they need to be mm -hmm. circumcised? Do you have to become fully Jewish before you can become a Christian. And, and Paul's answer is basically, well, you can make whatever rules you want, but I'm watching it, and the Holy Spirit is descending on these people and changing their lives. And, like, you know, I, I don't know that it's our job to sit here and, and say that this is required when the Holy Spirit is clearly, you know, doesn't care if he's been circumcised or not. Um, so th th this this question doesn't get resolved in this story. It doesn't get resolved in the book of Acts. I'm guessing it's not resolved today. Um, I, I feel very confident that at First Baptist Dallas it's not resolved. Um, or, well, actually, they probably th they, 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 they think it is. <laughs> um, this, is a lot, this is a lot like, I think, anyway, uh, what's not about Jesus himself, but you know, Barbara from Oklahoma, and where she grew up, up in the church there, uh, they didn't uh, play dominoes, oh, because they was playing in a darkly lit room with all the stuff that was on <coughs> dominoes. 
where I grew up, we played dominoes, but we didn't play cards. <laughs> <laughs> but we all believed in God. And so this is somewhat the same thing. Yeah. Some stuff got put in, some stuff got let out because they were all arguing about what goes where. And what's the important part? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it says right before here in 35, it says, you know, he talked to him and explained about Jesus. So we're, we're, we're coming close to our end of the time. But let me ask a few questions and see what you think. Um, what do you, how do you feel about the Spirit calling you away from something that appears to be going really well? I feel like I'm doing a good job, and now I'll be like, think Philip. He's having this great mission experience in Samaria, and the Spirit says, I need you to go talk to this one Ethiopian eunuch. He's, he's a good ways from here. He's down south of, of Jerusalem on the desert road. Go find him. Is that? Yeah. I would feel frustrated, but I, I'm guessing that I get the impression when I read these early years of them trying to grow the following of Christ that they're more, you know, wherever, wherever we're supposed to go, yeah. <laughs> they're kind of <clears throat> zealots or something, but maybe not. Yeah, well, we don't know how Philip ended up in Samaria. It, it doesn't. It doesn't appear that, or we're not told any version of the story that says the Spirit directed him to go to Samaria, and now is directing him, okay, you're good there, move on. Um, it, it, we're kind of left with the impression that maybe he went to Samaria just to get away from Jerusalem. Um, but then we, but we very clearly have the Spirit getting involved in moving him from Samaria onto this desert road south of uh, south of Jerusalem and very much uh, what we, and we, we know a lot of what happened in Ethiopia and legend is attributed to this story uh, we don't have any if the end doesn't appear again in Acts we don't really know what what happened um, imagine the affirmation of your faith though to receive that message, act on the message, you get there, it is not a coincidence that it happened just as you were told right. it would. And the, you can't unsee that. And, and you, you can't unbelieve that. And it, it's, there is a, the, the Spirit was clearly acting in this story on the eunuch before Paul's presence. I'm sorry, before Philip's presence. The, the, the eunuch has, is a God-fearing person. He, a, enough so to make this incredible journey to Jerusalem. He is the fertile ground, so to speak. And the Spirit recognizes this and says, okay, this guy is right at the tipping point. I need somebody, fill it. Go, go, go take care of this because he is a, a, enough of an influencer, if you will, in the, He's got his TikTok channel or whatever. And when he gets back to Ethiopia, this can do big things for us, but we got to act now. Um, so that there's something going on there with the Spirit uh, and this Ethiopian before Philip uh, is brought into the picture. <clears throat> um, how do you feel about the Spirit inviting outcasts to join the community? I think at this church, it seems like we're pretty good at it, mm -hmm. but then I kind of look around the facility and think about, you know, how could we get a wheelchair on the chancel, um, or in the choir, mm -hmm. or in the front door? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, have you, has anybody ever watched a wheelchair come out of the handicapped parking spot on the south side of the church to get into the sanctuary? Can you get there from there? Yeah, it's. Oh, yeah. In we are working the fact that we're thinking about it is, you know, but this building is 30, you know, 50 years old. We have places to park wheelchairs in the sanctuary. Yeah. We have invitations. But, they, but getting in there, yeah, like getting, there. <laughs> getting in there is through the office, over, right. up the ramp. And, we were on risk of yes, <laughs> when we first and, started this. And, and on the finance committee to figure out how to pay for everything. <laughs> they were working on the back of the yeah. 
It's a, I mean, and talking, and I mean, just, I mean, it's an old building, but it's kind of an indirect ground. To, yeah. to try to, but to try to figure out how to get a ramp in there up on the chancel is not a But the clearance is not enough for yeah. the distance. Yes. But a stair chair could work from yeah. the choir. There's all kinds of, it's just an interesting thought. I think we're very open to, uh, you know, other sexual orientations and things like that. But then uh, physically, maybe, maybe we still have some work to do. But I will tell you at my clinic where we have probably hundreds of people a day in wheelchairs coming and going. There are parts that are also not accessible. <laughs> so, and that building is not as old as this one is. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have elevators. So there's a lot of buildings where you can't get to the third floor. Yeah. Um, and then another thing to think about, just the closing thought, is how do you feel about the addition of that verse 37? Oh. Think about that. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Okay, let's go through our prayer requests here. Uh, I've got a couple more to add here. Uh, we'll save trouble for all of you. Eclipse people that are here, happy birthday to Barbara. Put Barbara yes. Peterson. Barbara Floyd. <laughs> Somebody was talking about Barbara Peterson when I did this for Barbara Floyd. <laughs> Okay. Uh, safe travels for David Slatton, uh, who's at his sister's 75th birthday this weekend. Um, and Don Floyd is having a pacemaker put on the 15th. Right. On that one. Uh, also, we're praying for Travis Keith, who is an, ex is an expert witness in a trial in uh, uh, Delaware next week. So he's going to be out next week um, as he has to stay for the entire trial. Ooh. So uh, a little different than what he's done in the past. So. We'll pray for you on that. Any other prayer requests that we have? Let's pray. I appreciate it. Paul, if you go for it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Father, we thank you for this day and the time that we can come and read your scripture. Um, and some of the scripture that doesn't seem to be there is uh, seems to be very important today. Well, we thank you for um, for the for the birthday of Barbara Floyd. Um, we pray for safe travels for David Slatton and to his sister's 75th birthday. And for Don Floyd, as he has a pacemaker installed on April 15th, we pray for safe travels for all those <coughs> eclipse visitors, uh, observers um, that are in the area, and uh, that they might get home safely. Father, thank you for Wilshire, for our pastor and our staff. Help us to be your hands and feet in this part of the world. And now we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I have a 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 I have